So let's just, let's break it down, because there's like 50 shades of gray, right, in, in sort of our, the ROI of television today. So take me through that. So the difference between addressable and advanced advertising, how do you guys define that from a buy perspective? Yeah, so it actually flows pretty well with what the, what the theme of the conference is, right? The conference is, is, isn't really focused around addressable advertising, it's focused around advanced advertising, which is, which is good. Now the last, the first two, two sessions, I think Brian and Dan really articulated the value of household level addressability as the advertiser's willingness to increase their frequency against their core customer segments or the segments most likely to convert. And we, and, and we all know that that business is developing and it's building and we're about half of every US TV household has the capability and that's great. And when you hear of one-to-one -one household addressable, that is what you think, but any true targeted television campaign, if done properly, starts to encompass all the various different constituents that Scott just mentioned on, on, his, on his panel uh, or session two seconds ago. And that's where it starts to get complicated. So when we look at a true targeted television campaign for an advertiser that gives us unlimited flexibility, right, to just take a particular segment, take their true target audience and run with it wherever and however and to the extent that we think we can, we start off obviously as granular as we can go with household level addressability. Then we expand that on to the devices as, as, as Brian mentioned before and in many cases we use the exact same form of measurement to cum together the reach, frequency and impressions delivered to those specific hyper segments against both television and the so let's devices. Make it, ma let's make it concrete, right? So a hyper segment is like yogurt eating moms that drive minivans in Duluth. Like what would that look like? Something like, like that. We could, we, could, we could say moms with children that bought soup in the past three weeks. Okay, so typically okay. a national, is a, do you typically have geography on that or zone? Uh, we typically don't have much geography on that. I mean, most, most advertisers that are involved in this advanced TV space, the majority tend to be national advertisers. Geography means less to them generally. So you can take it all the way down to the household level, include then the devices, roll that up to the zones, which is a zip code or a cluster of zip code, all using the same segments, all using the same data sources. And then you can even take it all the way up top to the national level. Scott was mentioning before about Nielsen demography and how, we're, how many advertisers are looking to actually reinforce that the messaging and the impressions and the GRPs are delivered to Nielsen demography. That's true too, but what we're seeing now with national linear television is advertisers are adding a second step to that. They're using data and they're understanding how all of those networks and programs and day parts are indexing against moms with kids that purchase soup, but then yet again are going back to the broader Nielsen demography for measurement. So it's, so it's segmentation from a targeting perspective, making decisions based on the segmentation, but then the currency is done on the, on the, uh, on the more traditional legacy method. Right, but let's, but let's talk about that, right, because, so we'll get into the operational side of it for a minute, but there's a lot of math there, because the challenge is that, and the point that was made by Matt and Scott, is that although everybody poo-poos on Nielsen, we're still all using Nielsen, and that's the currency of the day, right? So the challenge is, as a seller, when I go out and I sell you, your yogurt eating moms, and especially if I'm using set-top box level data, I've made a decision that whatever break or spot I give you that reaches that audience, I probably have blown out my general market Nielsen guarantee, right? So how does that translate and parlay into your challenge that if you're actually trying to make the linear buy, which is against the GRP guarantee, perform better, how's that parlay into an addressable buy that's using set-top box level data? So a national linear buy just does not parlay into an addressable buy right now, other than the fact that we're using, you can use the similar data source to select your content and your day parts based on what that data source is. But is it gonna be measured together? Can it be looked at together? Can there be too many conclusions drawn? No, I think the, the but that's okay. Like they don't have to be all collectively done at once. What we, what we need to continue to doing, what I think the industry's done a very good job of, is starting to really understand who the true customer is. You wind the clock back 18 months and you ask an advertiser who they wanna reach and they'll look you straight in the eye and say adults they did 49. That's pretty stupid. That's so, changing. So Mike, can you can we go back to our 50 Shades of Grey and carry yeah. it one forward? So we had addressable, so you can't parlay that into a national buy. What about an audience index buy? What about an advanced buy? 
Sure. I mean, audience indexing is, but don't forget, audience indexing has two forms, right? You can take the segment and you can collect a, a, a portfolio of localized inventory that index well against your segment, parlay that into your addressable hyper-targeted buy and view it as one, but you're not really going to be able to take the national television inventory and parlay it because that trade, the economics, the currency is still going to be Nielsen. So how do you assess the delta as far as the incremental value to, to a, an, an advertiser? Because what, I mean, whether we like it or not, human behavior is a brand manager is going to look at their linear buy and their effective CPM at that, you know, with the GRP guarantee, and they're going to look at their addressable buy, and they're going to do a cost comparison, right? Like, how do you, what's that conversation like yeah. out of two, three, 10x premium? So... And, and, it's, and it's all the above. It's two, it's three, it's 10. But any moron with a calculator can figure that out, right? If the national television target for the soup company we were just talking about is women 25 to 54, and that cost per thousand is $20. The cost per thousand to reach that hyper target of women with children that have purchased soup, that 20 is probably 90, right? And that's easily identified and sorted with a calculator. So then you go back and you say, to target that audience addressably, bless you, is probably $43. More than the 20, less than the 90. That's how you prove the economics in addressable. The second way you actually benchmark it truly is when the campaign's over and you tie it back to sales. That's the beauty of addressable television. If you execute it properly, meaning you get the target right, you pay the right price, and you measure it properly, you will show a higher return on ad spend than most national initiatives. Take me through that. When you're attribution modeling that you're using to actually assess sort of campaign performance and ROI, like where are we realistically? Because 24 months ago, 12 month latency on attribution modeling coming back was good. Now, you know, six months is great. What are you seeing? How long do you have to wait to have confidence and be able to put it on the table? It depends, right? If we're, if, if we're getting first parties, if we're using first party sales data and we're getting that directly from our client in as real time as they get it, it could be sooner. If we're getting first party data that's relying on a third party, I know that sounds weird, but it does happen, that can take a little bit more time. If we're truly using third party data to do some type of um, you know, qualitative lift analysis, that can be a little bit shorter. So it depends on the category, depends on the data, depends on the segment. But it is generally within, within three months where we're able to get back to most advertisers with an attribution or a return on ad spend or something that will give them the ability to say, yes, this worked, let's do it again, or no, this didn't, let's scrap it. Tell me what the upfront means. Or, I mean, for you from the, the per, sort of perspective and the frame of buying targeted television in whatever form it is, what does the upfront mean to you? Nothing. Thank Absolutely you. nothing. Right? Okay. The majority of addressable targeted television is, for lack of no other word, a scatter play. Where the upfront does play into is advertisers using data to define those segments to help better choose their portfolio of programming in the upfront. So, so that same soup company might use Catalina or Shopcom data to determine which networks and programs to buy in the upfront. But that's very separate from an addressable initiative that would likely be purchased for that particular client three, four months after the upfront's over. So have it, having had this experience and the privilege of sort of being on the buy side at one point. That was a while ago. A while ago showing my age. Um, and then now on the sell side, so, you know, my clients are sort of sellers of media. I'm trying to put on your hat and your job seems really hard to me because if I go and I sort of go through my list of, you know, sellers that are selling national television, uh, whether it's operators, broadcasters, programmers, et cetera, and how they're merchandising and productizing addressable and or targeted, right, or advanced television, whether it's indices based or it's, you know, it's set-top box level addressable. The segmentations, everything, it is, it's a hodgepodge, right? It is literally a salad bowl. Like, how do you, how do you manage that? It's, it's a hodgepodge, and that's, that is the, the hardest part of our job right now is, you know, on the addressable side, you're working with eight different systems who use various different technologies. Their boxes operate differently. They report back in a different manner, and, and that's, you know, that's all okay. Like, that's not, it's not great. It makes it very manual and laborious for us, but you can only criticize so much for that. The, the part that, 
we don't love is all of those various different systems they don't really care so much about working with one another, right? The advertiser wants as many of those households that have purchased soup in the past six months, irrespective of geography or operator system. So that's, so that, that's one issue that we have, and that's part of what makes our job manual. However, the results are showing that it works, and therefore, right now, the manual process is worth it. On the national side, the part that we're, try that we're struggling with is, you know, those guys, they're, 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 they control the majority of the, uh, of the television business, right? The national television media owners, and they are very much getting into this um, indexing, if you will, space. The challenge we're facing with them is, as we all try to figure out a model that works with most of, for all of us, when the data suggests that we should be buying more for, right, buying more of or paying more for some of their longer tail inventory or inventory that doesn't sell as well, they're all for it. And I don't disagree with them, right? If something- Are if they Neil's, price gouging? Well, if not, you they're, bring no, the demand to they're their- They're not price the gouging. If, if they're not price gouging, they're, they're saying if normally the market value for this piece of media is against, against 18 to 49 is $7, but that same piece of media against soup purchasers is $12, you know what? We should be paying close to the $12. The flip side is when that same data source shows that that prime time unit is worth 20% less to that thing, then they kind of tend to throw their arms in the air and say, oops, supply and demand. That's where it gets a little fussy. So just the level set, what I think is really interesting is that the sort of the big gorilla in the room is that not only are sellers managing their addressable and advanced inventory in giant spreadsheets with 300 macros, it sounds like you and Jamie are doing the same thing to run your business. We are, we are, and it's, it's not, an, Everyone in the addressable space, whether you're a data provider, whether you're an MVPD, whether you're an agency, an aggregator, an advertiser, uh, everyone is working manually. It's not just us. Like agencies, we tend to piss and moan a little bit more than most, but we're as manual and as laborious as our jobs are, everybody else's is as well. It's just the nature of this beast right now. So you got one thing, one thing you can tell your suppliers that would make your life easier. Mo overall, would it would have a positive impact on the quality of life of the Modi team and family? What would that be? You know what, to be honest with you, I don't think there's one single thing that could flip it around, but I think we're all doing a very good job, Modi and all of our suppliers, of sorting these issues individually. I would say that hopefully over the next 12 to 18 months, we can start to sort the issues collectively.